Hey, any filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, what camera gear is essential for your summer vacation? Plus, your questions about CTO and CTB gels, shooting in low light, and whether it's legal to use a news broadcast in your film. Hello, Nick. Hello, Griffin. How are you, sir? Happy Independence Day. That's in the future. I'm confused. <laughs> uh, happy Independence Day to you as well. Uh, I, right yeah, we now, are recording this will not be here before. on July Independence 4th. Day, so that freaked me out. I thought I was late, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> where, where are you going? I am going to beautiful Door County, Wisconsin. We get a uh, lake house every that's... summer, and kind of the extended family gets together for a little, a little family gathering for a week. It's nice and relaxing. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to a, to a little break. Well, yeah, you do this every year. I'm trying to remember, did we last year skip a podcast? Did it fall on our break? Or did you actually record one from Wisconsin? I feel like we recorded one, but maybe from Chicago. So we fly into Chicago, which is where all our family is. And then we all drive up to Wisconsin. Um, so I feel like we did it from Chicago, yeah. maybe. I think that's when I yeah, did like yeah. in my dad's basement. It looked kind of cool. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's what's going on. Yeah. So what I want to talk about today, because... I've been doing some personal travel recently, mm -hmm. and you are doing this travel next week. I want to know what you're taking with you. Talk about what we talk a lot about camera gear to bring on professional projects, but just what if about you're a personal project? Being leisurely, what you don't bring at all. I definitely don't bring it all. In fact, um, you know, the, the question was, am I recording the podcast? Because that affects kind of what uh, what gear I'm going to bring. And I think the answer is we won't need to record a podcast episode, which kind of frees me up to only need to bring yes. whatever I want to bring to have around. So here, you know, I've been making a list of things I need to bring. So well, should, should I bust what are that we, out? What are you not bringing because you don't have to do the podcast next week? You don't have to bring a microphone. Yeah, probably. I mean, this microphone surprisingly takes up a lot of travel space. This blue bottle. Yeah, I don't even usually bottle. bring this big blue baby bottle. I usually just bring like a shotgun mic. Yeah. But I'm always, it doesn't sound the same. And I always kind of wish I had the, the podcast. And mic I think with we me. did one of those one time where I used my Rode Video Mic Pro. And I remember we had really pro big audio problems. So if I was going to do the podcast, I was going to bring, I was going to find a way to bring all this with just so I could do a proper okay. job. Um, yeah. Since we since we don't have to do that, that that makes life easy. So the mic stays home. Hang on, let me get this list open, so I don't forget anything important. Uh, I'm gonna bring my G85, obviously. Um, of course. I have one of those small Joby Gorillapod tripods that I will probably yeah. bring in lieu of any major tripod. I do have this smaller tripod that I use for the podcast because it sits on my desk that could work uh, in a travel situation, but. I, I don't think I'm going to need it. Most of the stuff I'm going to do is going to be handheld anyway. Um, and the Gorillapod may even be more versatile. You can hang that from a tree, whereas you can't do that with a small, standard-style tripod. Exactly, exactly. Um, so you could shoot all the portraits and time lapses you might be inspired to shoot with that tripod. Exactly right. So I'll bring that. I also have a little... Um, iPod tripod mount that kind of clips onto the iPhone yeah. uh, so that I can attach the iPhone to that as well, which is handy um, for a little secondary camera. What does that camera. do? Is it just like a clamp? It's just like a clamp. Onto the phone? Yeah. 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 Um, but it works pretty good. Um, it's a nice one. Let's see. I'm going to bring my drone, of course. Um, I just started recharging the up the batteries, knowing that they've probably discharged over the last couple of weeks since the last time I used it. So I did oh, that. Definitely. You may even need to charge them again when you get there. Probably. Probably. At least they'll have something in them, though. Uh, lenses is really where I've been going back and forth. I don't want... I'm, I'm very tight on space. So uh, I thought about going one lens with just my 12 to 35. Um, yeah. That's probably all I'll shoot with. But just in case, I always like to bring my 45 millimeter prime for, you know, um, portraiture work. Um, that's my F17, F18, F17 lens. Um, yeah. So that's nice to have, too. So I'll probably stick that in there. So I'm thinking I'll go two lenses. If I were going to add a third, it would probably be my pancake, my 20 millimeter uh, pancake lens, because that's great for walking around, too. So if I get if I have some right. room, that might sneak its way in. Um, You're saying the 20 millimeter would be perfect for 
you need to slim it down even more. Even the 12 to 35 is too big of a lens for the, you know, just to have less weight yep. walking around. And it's faster, right? It's a, it's an F1.8 yep. uh, lens. So it'll be a better low light, better low light lens. lens. Exactly. Um, and then the whole camera is super slim. You know, I could, you know, maybe slip it into my wife's purse and she won't yell at me too much. Yeah. So are you going to take a bag? Uh, yeah, I will bring my um, uh, Peak Design 20-liter uh, everyday backpack, which will be okay. my carry-on on the airplane. So it's got just going to be film gear. It's going to be my laptop, which, yeah. So getting into other technology I need to bring. Uh, even though I'm on vacation, work always crops up a little bit. So I definitely have to have my laptop with me. I'll bring an iPad. Um, I'll have my Bose. But it sounds like we've headphones. identified a gap in what you're bringing if your 20 liter bag is, is your big carry-on backpack it fits all your camera gear then when you get there that bag's probably too big to like take you know hiking through the woods or something it's so you're you're forced to put your camera in your wife's purse yeah i mean i the 20 liter is not a bad every day like i've gone hiking with it and it's fine um yeah so i i, I could i could do that like, you know Am I going to wear it every time we leave? No. And I might want to bring my camera with me, and it might just float around loose in the car and things like that a little bit. Do you ever put the strap on and just keep it around your neck? I do, though. I got that wrist strap um, like a year oh, ago, yeah. and I, f I find I much prefer that. So sometimes I'll just put that wrist strap on and kind of just kind of carry it loosely in my hand is kind of how I'll walk around with it. Yeah. And what's your goal? You just want to chronicle the vacation? You'll take some photos and take some video? Yep, exactly. I always have grand plans of editing some great vacation video. <laughs> it never seems to actually happen. Um, how do you do that? How do you motivate yourself to actually go <laughs> and edit a project like that when you're like, I don't want it. I don't want to spend the time on that. Well, one, one trick for me is just handling it right away, handling the edit while I'm still excited about the footage I just shot. Yep. So a lot of times I'll spend a day out with my wife. We're sightseeing. We shoot some video. I mean, I did this when I was in Japan. Uh, it was just beautiful stuff out there. And so I just immediately threw it in a timeline. And honestly, the kind of stuff you're doing, you may only need five video shots, 10 video shots to show people what's going on yep. in your day. And so you could make a whole video that's only a minute long, just grab a music track real quick, cut it down, throw some video clips on top. And that's why, you know, you, you're bringing your laptop with you. I always have my laptop with me. I can just, while I'm sitting in bed that night, just import the footage or import the video, the photos into Lightroom, do some quick edits, post something on Facebook. Just try to handle it as you go so you don't end up at the end of your trip with hours of work to do. Right. That will never get done because you get back from vacation and yeah. real life in, intrudes again. That's a good yeah. idea. Hold me to that, would you? Send me a message or something and say, hey, Nick, <laughs> I haven't seen anything on Instagram yet. What the hell? A and you have to pick and choose also. your moments to shoot, too, because like... I never want to be the guy that always has my camera out. There are people that are comfortable with that. And people, there are a lot of people who like to vlog their lives and, and they're pretty comfortable just always rolling. And I just feel like I'm too shy to always have a camera out. I don't like what it does to social interactions. Right. I don't always want people, I don't want to draw attention to myself all the time, having a camera rolling all the time. So you just have to pick your moments. And I think for me, a lot of it is, I like shooting the transitional moments. Like you may be in a space for a long time enjoying yourself. And then I just, I usually try to remember like, let's get some video while we're in the car. Let's get some video while we're on the train. Just one shot, if, if, if anything, okay. just to show that that moment happened. And I think that can tie the story together and show all the things you did without having to have a camera out all the time. Interesting, I wouldn't have thought of that. That makes sense. Like often when I'm walking, it's like, hey, we're walking through the woods right now to get to our next spot. Let's shoot this. I'll shoot one thing when we get there, and it'll tell the story of how we got there and then what we did when we got there. So we'll see if I actually come through and put something out there. 
Right. I can put it on Instagram <laughs> TV. Have you seen this Instagram TV thing? Yeah, I have. I don't quite understand how to be involved in it. I don't either. I think <laughs> I think anything maybe that you put on your story will also be on Instagram TV. TV. I don't. We shouldn't talk about it if we don't know know the details. But it looks right. kind of cool. The idea is they're trying to promote more long form video content in a vertical video format on Instagram, yeah. which I think is cool. Yeah, clearly Facebook and Instagram understand the importance of video, and they need to be a big player in it. You know, I feel like I. I think there must be a way for us to get our content on there. I feel like um, uh, your friend John Luna. I saw. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but he has created some sort of uh, short film, which maybe we can link to. Um, and I think I saw that it was on. I, I saw it on Facebook first, but I think I saw it on Instagram TV, and I was just kind of clicking through it real quick to see what it was all about. Oh, interesting. So um, maybe yeah. we can ask him <laughs> how we got it on there and how that works, because I think that might be an interesting right, yeah. format for us to explore a little bit. Maybe I'll put well, some I'll sure vacation on Instagram, Instagram in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. So. I want. I also want to talk about the new backpack I got Ooh. for this kind of travel. Really? Uh, okay. It actually, it's not that new. Well, it's new for me, but it looks almost identical to my previous backpack. Of course. So I have my big backpack, the photo, uh, or what's it called? It's called the, uh, it's Think Tank Perception Pro is the big one okay. that I take you know, it can carry two cameras and five lenses and audio equipment and all that. But for years, I've been using this Low Pro Photo Hatchback 16 liter bag. It's a gray bag. Uh, and I like it because it's a little bit smaller. It has a little uh, camera pocket in the back bottom, but I can fit a camera body, a couple lenses, a laptop if I have to. And then there's a big pocket on the top, so I could even I can really pack it full of audio equipment too. I mean, it, it could be a production bag, but I usually use it for sightseeing because it's relatively lightweight. I'll usually just put like one camera body and two lenses in there and that's all I need. Yep. And my previous one, the slate gray one, it's just, it got a little beat up. I mean, I've been using it for many years now and the zipper on the back stopped working. So I just decided I should replace it. And so I went back to B&H and they're selling a black one. The one I have, the current one I have is slate gray, but they, they're selling a black one now. I don't really understand the model number difference because the previous one is a 16LAW and the new one is the hatchback BP150AW2, <laughs> which seems like a ridiculous model name. I'm Googling it. but. It's the same backpack. I actually prefer it because it's black and doesn't have the silly, the previous one had like low pro and giant letters on the back uh, in this really weird stylized way. Uh, and this one also is $20 cheaper for some reason right now. Hmm. The, the low pro photo hatchback black version is only $59 instead of $79. That seems like a good deal. But I also I'm tempted noticed to buy one. I love buying has the, I don't know why. Yeah, I know. Me too. I love bags. <laughs> B&H, though, is also selling the 22-liter version, so closer to the size of your Peak Design. Mm -hmm. They're actually ha they have that on sale, normally 110 down to 70 right now. But uh, I definitely recommend the black, the one I just got. The link is in the show notes. Uh, if you're just looking for like a relatively lightweight bag, it can handle a camera, a couple lenses, and some more stuff, I think it's a pretty good form factor. And you basically tuck this bag empty into your luggage and then it becomes kind of your day bag on a trip. Is that right? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, like, so we were just in Los Angeles and L er, and Las Vegas, uh, me and my wife and, and her parents. I was there for work, but there wasn't very much work to do. So I, I had to bring all my camera gear, the big backpack and everything. But knowing that we were just going to be sightseeing around Hollywood and Las Vegas and all that, I pack, I kind of flatten out the photo hatchback bag. It's empty mm -hmm. in my suitcase. And then when I get there, I can do the work I need to do with the big backpack. But then when we're running around town, I just bring the little one. And I find 
I'm usually bringing my GH5, and I had all my lenses with me, or all my favorite lenses with me for the project I was doing, but to slim it down, I, I find that I'm usually bringing the 8 to 18 millimeter because I like getting some wide establishing shots, good time-lapse lens. Yep. And then I find the other lens I'm walking around with a lot is just the 25 millimeter. I think for the same reason you use your 45, it's just a good like portrait lens. They also have this photo hatchback in midnight blue and gray, which I kind of like. You see that? Yeah, although that one's more expensive for some reason. $20 more for a blue one. Oh, yeah. I must have done it. But yeah, I kind of find having a zoom lens and one prime lens oh, the blue should be able to handle a, everything you need. Oh, the blue one is the BP250, not the 150. I think I'm also the 250. Or no, mine is the 150. What's I don't know what that difference? even means. Maybe it's bigger. Maybe it's like a 22 liter instead of a 16 liter. Perhaps. Perhaps. So yeah, I never have enough room for all my stuff. I probably should get a second bag. I think that would be smart, but alas, I have not. And it's probably too late well, since I, I through, leave tomorrow morning. You know, I, I've been on a lot of trips with my wife where I try to bring just a little bit of gear, like one camera, one lens, and... Ultimately, the more that I'm asking Amy to like throw a lens in her purse, she just gets mad at me for having to carry all my weight. So <laughs> yeah, that's good. one of the reasons I, I, I usually get in trouble for like, can I put this in your purse? And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah, no. All that Bring room. your own bag. I just got pockets. <laughs> a lens in a pocket is not comfortable. I know we've all had to do it, but. Oh, yeah. I mostly got the photo hatchback in the first place for film festivals, because it felt weird to carry a giant camera bag into movie theaters and oh, yeah. like squeezing past people. And ever since then, it's just become kind of my my vacationing camera backpack. It's a nice size. Wunderbar. That means wonderful in German. <laughs> in German. For the record. <laughs> All right, have we talked about bags enough? Should we answer some real questions? Yeah, let's answer some questions not about camera bags. Uh, okay, why don't you start us out since I don't know where yeah, I am. Yeah, I'll read this Facebook message from Emily who is wants to be working on a documentary, but she has a couple questions before she gets started. And one of them is about legal issues. She's going to interview people, as you'd expect for a documentary, and she wants to make sure that they're legally protected. After they interview people, they don't want anyone to sue them or claim that they have rights to some of the profit of the film or anything like that. So she's wondering if we have any experience with legal documents for documentaries. And is it costly to do that? Well, I think you uh, definitely had everyone who appeared sign a release, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a video talent release. I'll throw it in the show notes at hey.film. Um, but we should point out, as always, when we talk about legal stuff, we're not lawyers, right? Maybe I am. No, I'm not. I'm actually not a lawyer. <laughs> you passed the bar the in your free time and didn't tell me? I am not a lawyer. Yeah, right. we're, we are definitely not, uh, you know, don't blame us when you do get sued. But I think, I mean... It depends on how airtight you want your documents to be. Yes, you probably should go talk to a lawyer. If you actually are concerned with getting sued and you really want to make sure that you have the proper legal documentation that protects you. But at its core, a legal document like this, uh, a release form, is just proof that someone understood what they were getting into and that they wanted to be part of the project. So I think... I've said this before, at the very least, even if you had an email with someone where they said, oh, sure, I'd love to be interviewed, and I understand what you're, how you're going to use this in your film. I mean, even that could be taken to court and say, look, this person knew what was going on. So a video release form is just a very intentional form of that. You made sure to put it in writing. So I don't think my video release form is airtight. There's probably, some, you know, I bet if I had paid a lawyer to look at it, they'd find something that they would want to change. But my goal was just to make it simple and just say, hey, I agree to be part of Griffin's documentary. It's his copyrighted work and he can do whatever he wants with it. That's essentially what my document says. Good. <laughs> Good. 
So I don't think it has to be very difficult. Um, and I, also, I, you know, if you're nice to people when you interview them and they understand what the project is and they understand how you might use it, it's all about setting expectations. It's it's hard to imagine people would freak out when they see themselves in the film or freak out when they find out you made money off of it or something. Right. And I wouldn't think somebody who got interviewed in a documentary would have any real standing for any cut of the profits or anything like that, even absent some sort of signed document. Am I crazy? Yeah, it seems like it'd be hard for them to claim that they should they should make some money off of it. Right. I mean, the only way they would have a strong case is if they actually had you sign a contract where it said, I agree to pay this person yeah. X amount of dollars. Then you're getting into trouble. And then Emily also wants to know how I managed to get Sriracha, uh, get enough attention for Sriracha to make it into film festivals and onto streaming services. And that's a long answer. So I'll hmm. put some some links in the show notes. I think there's a there's a few things you should check out. I have in Video Maker magazine, I wrote an article called Telling the Story of Sriracha, which deals with some of the publicity, how I talked to reporters, how I did a Kickstarter campaign and generated interest in the film before releasing it. And then I also have a blog post called Five Lessons Learned from My Profitable Indie Documentary, which really goes into the finances of the film and talks a little bit about raising money and interest and everything. And then we, Nick, you and I actually talked all, a lot about that in our eighth episode of the podcast. It was a long time ago. One of our early episodes, yeah. That was the one where we were together at the YouTube. Uh, Next Media the Labs YouTube space or in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. So I'll put links to all of those things in the show notes at hey.film. Um, and yeah. That probably explains it better than I could in, in two minutes. a couple of minutes to do it. Yeah. We've got a Twitter question from Robert. What are your suggestions when working with colored gels? I've recently purchased some and have no idea where to start. Griffin, specifically, do you find yourself using gels very often? I mean, other than CTO and CTB. If so, for what? So I do use CTO gels and... So CTO and CTB, the CT is color temperature, the O is orange, and the B is blue. Mm -hmm. And so a full CTO gel is designed to take a blue light, like a sunlight kind of balanced light, and turn it into an indoor color. And a full CTB light is designed to take sunlight, wait, I'm saying this wrong. Uh, I said the first one right. A CTB gel is designed to take an incandescent light, an indoor light, and turn it into the color of sunlight. So that's what those two do. And I am currently using two CTO gels at the moment. I have these LED lights, one of them shining on me, and one of them is a backlight shining on my wall. They're both LEDs and they're both kind of blue. So I've added some CTO gels to kind of help it match the color of the room and the lighting I already have in here. And so I'm actually using a quarter CTO gel on the one in front of me and a eighth CTO gel on the one behind me. So I don't even need a full CTO for these lights. My, I think my, my face would look really orange right now if I went full CTO. Now, I don't know if this applies to video or if this is something you do, but in theater, we would often use... Um, an orange light from one side of the stage and a blue light from the other side of the stage that would combine yeah. on the stage. Where they mix on the front of a face, they basically combine to a nice normal white. But on the sides, you get right. orange on one side and blue on the other a little bit, which adds depth. So it kind of, yeah. as opposed to somebody looking so flat, that kind of color difference um, shapes the face a little bit. Is that something you ever do in oh, your yeah. video production work or, or is that kind of more of a stagecraft thing? I don't. I, I imagine some film people might do that. Um, but I am kind of thinking along those lines that generally I don't want a light coming from the same direction as the camera. I guess in theater, you have to kind of account for all the different viewing positions people could be watching from. At least on video, you're only concerned with the direction the camera's looking. And so putting a light off to the side will create the shadow and depth that you want. 
Um, but if you put the camera and the light in the same position, then you'll end up with kind of no shadows. And it's hard to get a 3D look out of someone. As for other gels, I do have, I can pull out my little book of gels. Don't hurt yourself. Yeah. I guess I have two sets of gels. I have a daylight to tungsten lighting pack, which is just all CTO gels, and they're all different levels, like full CTO, half CTO, quarter, eighth, all that. And then I also have a visual effects gel pack, which is like crazy colors, like dark blue and purple and pink and all those things, and green. Those I very rarely use unless I'm trying to do some crazy white balance effect, like my evil white balance trick that we've talked about in the past. Um, or maybe I'll do like an accent light in the background. So sometimes like this light that I have behind me on the podcast, it can be fun to throw a red gel on it or a green gel on it and let it light up the wall in a really different, interesting way. Probably something you would do more in narrative work in terms of using other colors, right? As opposed to documentary. Yeah. I'm trying to think in in the limited amount of narrative work I've done, I definitely have taken like a dark blue gel before and used it to kind of simulate nighttime lighting or right. like kind of a kind of a darker light source. Like it doesn't look like it's it's sunlight coming in. So yeah, it's I think it's fun to to grab a pack of gels and play around with it and see what you get. But I think for the documentary kind of work I'm doing, I almost never use a gel. I usually just, you know, this is a weird situation shooting the podcast where I am mixing light sources and I need to kind of control the color of each light. Mm -hmm. But in documentary, I usually would just prefer to find an area where I can just use one light source. Let's go shoot this near a window, let's get the sunlight, turn off all the incandescent lights, and we'll just deal with one color, I can white balance the camera. Like, for me, white balance can kind of control away any reason I would use a gel. We have a tweet from Migos, wondering if I use a separate picture profile for daylight and low light filming. Do you use any different settings? I do not. I mean, I might change my ISO a bit, but in terms of the picture profile, I'm almost always on natural. Okay, yeah, me too. I mean, and you might change a lens too. You'll flip sure. your 20 millimeter pancake because it's, it's F1.7. <laughs> or is it F1.7? What is it? F1.8? F1.7? Yeah, right in, right in there somewhere. Yeah. I can't remember. I should go find it. And yeah, that's me too. I'll change lenses to deal with low light. I'll try to bring in some lighting if I need to. But other than that, I'm not changing anything on the camera. I keep it in natural picture profile most of the time. Sometimes I shoot projects in vlog. Uh, but I, I like to keep my picture profile the same throughout a project, regardless if it's inside or outside. Outside, I'll probably use some ND filters to control for how bright it is. And indoors, I'll take those off. And I may have to yeah, bump up my ISO, or if it's really extreme low light, maybe I have to sacrifice a little bit of shutter speed, or, but I'm, I'm probably opening up my lens as much as I can, but same picture profile. I got an email from Richard, who is saying, you and those cameras make a special kind of magic together. You get RE level performance <laughs> out of them. We, your audience, wouldn't expect you to reveal the secrets of how you set up your $2,500 cameras so they produce footage that looks like it came from a $60,000 Alexa. But if you ever do, it would make a great podcast segment. Griffin, what are your magic secrets? <laughs> what are my magic secrets? I wish I had some amazing secret uh Richard, I definitely will share everything. Uh, I mean, I try to share everything I do with these cameras. I also think he's overblowing the quality. He's talking about my hand-cut film that I shot with GH5. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm proud of that product. There's some good shots in it, but not every shot is perfect. And I certainly don't think that I... I mean... I probably did shoot it better than I would have shot it with a $60,000 Alexa because I know how to use the GH5 and I don't know how to use an Alexa and I would screw it up. Uh, so the camera, you know, an expensive camera doesn't make everything look better unless you know how to use the tool. 
but you know, going off of the last question from Migos, I think it's important to find light. So I'm either shooting outdoors when I can to take advantage of good sunlight. The ice factory where I was shooting, they had a big garage door that was open and it was pretty much just sunlight coming in. So I was shooting in good light and everything looks good in good light. And then when I went into a bar and it was dark, I'm putting on the best lenses I have. I was using my 42.5 F1.2 and my 12 millimeter F1.4. So I'm using the brightest lenses I can possibly use in a dark situation. And then even then, half the bar I'm shooting in is too dark even for that. So I'm bringing in my, some light of my own. Uh, so I think the key is just make sure you're not shooting in darkness and then you want to deal with high noise levels and regardless, I think, what picture profile you're shooting with, it should look pretty good with light. And that is the Does magic. that sound like my secrets? <laughs> and everything we've talked about on this podcast for 68 previous episodes, you know, good audio, <laughs> good, good camera movements, all kind of helps the whole project feel more professional, more high-end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think just keeping your camera pointed forward, not no gratuitous panning, I think always looks nice. So Scott wrote to me on Twitter. He watched my Creative Live class and he enjoyed it. And he's trying to make a career change late in his career to freelance journalism, photojournalism. Uh, but he also wants to shoot some personal documentary video projects. So he's wondering, when I shot Sriracha, was I concerned about how people thought I would portray them in the film, my subjects? He says, I generally think it is very smart for anyone approached by a camera, be it press or film, to think through the situation. In your release slash discussions, did you address some of these possible concerns and how? Nick, you were with me on a lot of these interviews. How would you describe people's concern level I mean, I think by the time we were there in front of them, you had done all the hard work of laying the proper expectations and so they knew what they were getting into. Um, so everyone yeah. seemed very excited to be part of the project. I don't remember anybody being real hesitant or concerned about how you were going to portray them. But I think that's a testament to the work you had probably done up to the point that we got there with the cameras, right? Uh, you had laid that groundwork yeah. of trust. I mean... I think the Sriracha folks didn't want to talk to you at first, right? It took a little bit of convincing them of your intentions before they even agreed to to let us come. Is that right? Right. David Tran is the only person I think of in relation to Scott's question who had concerns about being in the film. There were a couple other people that just didn't respond and didn't end up being in the film or, or flaked on me. But um, David, who the film is about... When I first emailed him, his assistant emailed me back and just said, mm, I don't know, I don't think David is interested in participating in a project like this. And that was tough for me because everyone else so far had said yes. And I mean, I do think that it starts from your first email building trust with people that you need to prove in that first email that you are credible, that you're nice, and give them a good reason to say yes to the project. Because I don't think people like to say no. So if they think, oh, this sounds like a fun project and I'll get something good out of it and Griffin seems like a nice guy and he's polite and he, uh, you know, he, he sent me a link to his work and it looks good, I trust that he'll make me look good in a film. I think most people felt that way by the time we were interviewing them. But David did have concerns because he probably had the most to lose. He has a big business and he was worried about sharing secrets of that business and would people steal all his trade secrets. And so it did take some convincing, but I think when I showed him that I was excited to do the project regardless if he was involved, I mean, I really wanted him involved, but I thought his story was so good, I was gonna do it anyway. And I showed him that I cared about the subject matter and I was persistent, but polite, and I was able to answer all his questions. I think it just kind of put him at ease that, okay, I can see that this guy is earnest and doing this for the right reasons. and. Maybe I can trust him. We got a YouTube comment but, uh, from Robert. 
Hey, Griffin, I saw your master class. It was pretty good, but I wanted to ask, how did you change the color of the truck in Sriracha from yellow to white? How do you do that? I want to change the color of a car from white to black in a short film I'm doing. Wasn't it from orange to white? Am I crazy? Yeah, it was an, it was an orange truck <clears throat> that I, I made white. Uh, I like the way you read that question. You were like, I saw your master class. It was pretty good. I, I was even going to play it up more, but I decided to just give it up. It was all right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in that class, and I think also on the podcast, we've talked about this effect where in Sriracha, I, there was an orange truck and I wanted it to match a white truck for continuity reasons. So... I changed it from from orange to to white, and the way that I did that was really just using a, a chroma key, the same way you would take out green of a green screen. I just told the chroma key to take out the orange of the truck, mm -hmm. and that's pretty easy for letting it find the edges of something. When the orange truck is surrounded by essentially bright white concrete, was the rest of the background going on. Um, the color difference was enough that the the chroma keyer could do that work really well for me. But a chroma keyer will also find that color everywhere in the frame, not just in the area that you're looking at. So I usually combine a chroma keyer with a mask. So I may make several layers. I may make, I may duplicate the video that I'm working on and stack it on top of itself. And in this case, I think I made a mask around the, the orange part of the truck. I can just loosely make kind of an oval around it. And then when I apply the chroma key effect, I'm only applying it inside that area. So I don't have to- So you don't have to worry about weird areas that might have a little orange in them that get screwed up. Right, because there was a, it's a truck full of red jalapenos and red, when you shine sunlight on it, it may look orange on one side of the pepper and right. dark red on the other side of the pepper. So it was, it was gonna key out all the peppers too. So I just tried to isolate it to that part of the truck. And because the, that part of the truck had some weird shapes to it, I, you know, I probably ended up stacking several layers where maybe the chroma keyer would do most of the work, but I would see, oh, it kind of messed up this edge. So maybe I'll go in and manually mask out that edge. So you can see how it can get kind of complicated, but the chroma keyer was doing most of the job for me. Good. And then once I've isolated that, the chroma keyer is really just taking it away, so it just becomes empty blackness. So if there's nothing underneath that layer, it's just black. Uh, I could put anything under there I want. I could put white, I could put a pattern, I could put anything. But what I ended up doing is just putting another layer of the video. So, so you the same duplicated truck. the shot. Yeah. And then So no. I'm putting the shot itself in the gap that the chroma keyer is creating. And so when you first do that, you're back to an orange truck, you're back to normal because I've just put the same shot in the hole. But I can take that layer of that truck and first thing I did was just desaturate the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Just did a color effect and took out all the color. And when you take orange, dark orange and make it grayscale, it just becomes dark gray. So that's what it looked like at first. So then to make it white, I just pushed up the highlights until it was not pure bright white, because I think that would be too far, but I probably went up 80% or something and just made it kind of a kind of a bright gray, really. And that way it retains all its shape and texture and all that jazz, as opposed to just putting a white block yeah. underneath it, which would just make the truck look crazy. Yeah, I think if I just put a white, you know, a custom layer, just a solid white color, it would, it would just, yeah, there'd be no texture to it, no shadows, it would look wrong. And so I think retaining the original footage was the best way to make it look natural. Now that sounds like some movie magic. Very so sad. let's see, do we really answer Robert's question? He wants to change the color of a car from white to black. That can be kind of difficult. Well, you could do a very similar thing to what you've done, except maybe you need to um, invert the colors on that second layer. Yeah. But see, inverting it would be wrong because, you know, a, a white car is not white. 
like we just talked about with shadows and things. It's bright gray in some places, in other places where the sun hitting it, sun's hitting it, it might be perfectly white. In other places where it's in the shadow, it might actually be dark gray. And so if you invert it, you're, you're just going to You're going to reverse your shadows. Yeah. So that won't work. Um, I mean, I, I think this technique could work, but... I'm uh, sure there are colors. You're making a really drastic change, to, yeah. so it could be difficult. Yeah. yeah. It'd probably be easier to change the color to to pink or to <laughs> to orange or something rather than like full black. Because uh, a black car is going to interact in the environment differently than a white well, car. You may also have to deal just, with some reflections. Maybe you just bring up the shadows. Like you brought up the um, highlights. Maybe, you know, you can just bring the whole exposure down on that layer and get it really dark. Yeah, I would try that. Try try chroma keying. I mean, you might even use a luma keyer, which is essentially the same thing as chroma key, but just affects Brightness. bright white things. Yeah. yeah. And just try lowering the whole thing, lower the midtones. I mean, lower the entire exposure, the shadows, the highlights, and the midtones, and see where it gets you, and see if you're happy with how it looks. So our final email today is from Austin, who is working on a film, and he's wondering if he can put some footage from his local news in. He's wondering if weather reports on local television are considered public domain or fair use or anything like that. Thinking about using clips slash audio, but was not sure if that's legal or how he should approach it. Well, I would say they are not public domain. I mean, that's copyrighted right. content. Um, and fair use doesn't really have anything to do with what you're using. It has to do with how you're using it. So that's really the question is, can you use it under fair use? I would say there are a variety of situations where you could use a news report in a documentary and have that be considered fair use, but that is going to depend on the specifics of the project you're using it in, not on the weather report itself. Am I thinking through that correctly? Yeah, you said that exactly right. I mean, this is definitely a copyrighted work. I mean, people went to work and were paid to make this broadcast. There was, you know, the person who designed the maps. Uh, that's a creative work. The person who stood up and delivered the weather report, that's a creative work. The person who pointed the camera and the way that they broadcasted it on the TV, all of that stuff is creative work. So it's definitely all copyrighted and not in the public domain unless the station decides to put in the public domain. Maybe they do decide all of this stuff. We do want it available for people to use, but they would have to explicitly say that. But there are situations, I mean, fair use is designed to take things that are copyrighted and use them because you have a fair use right in many cases to steal other people's work. And it really, really boils down to, are you making a comment on that work and does the comment you want to make require that you show that work to make your point? So I think if he was making a film that said, hey, look, my local TV station is really good at reporting the weather and here's a great example of how great they are. Hmm. <laughs> you, could, you could probably get away with showing 10 seconds or maybe, I mean, arguably you could show a minute if that's what it took to make your point. Um, but I think the more you use, the more dangerous it is. Uh, the more you're relying on their work and not doing your own work, your own creative work, and not transforming that work, uh, it feels more like theft than, than transformative fair use. Now, what uh, if you're doing a documentary about some event that happened and you want to show a news broadcast about that event? So you're not commenting at all on the broadcast you're using, you're using it as a reference point for, you know, this other event. In that situation, are we outside of fair use? And it makes more sense just to ask the news station if you can use their footage or what, what, how would you approach that? Well, to start, it, it's good that you point out just asking them because, yeah, you can always ask any copyright holder if you can use their footage and maybe they'll say yes for some reason. So you can always try that. Uh, I, what you described does sound like it's outside of fair use because now you're essentially stealing the work they already did. You want to report on this event. They already reported on the event, and you want to use their footage and their reporting to talk about the event. Um, so, yeah, I think you can only use their work 
to talk about their work. If you want to talk about, I mean, if you were making a documentary about this weather person or about this news station, I think you'd have a much better argument to use their footage because you're saying, look, I'm talking about what they do and making a comment about what they do. Maybe you're criticizing them. Maybe you're saying I have the worst newscaster in the world on my local station and here's proof. Look how they flubbed all their lines. That's within your right, even though it may make them mad. That is a very good fair use argument to take their content. But I think if you just want to like make a short film and you want to, to throw something on the TV that says, there's a tornado coming your way, look out. And then your whole film is about being in a tornado. I don't think you have, that's not a strong fair use argument. Because uh, why did you single them out? Why did you steal their content when you could have made it yourself? You're not really making a comment about them. Interesting. Yeah. I'm glad you're a lawyer to but help yeah, us with I, this, Griffin. Yeah, again, don't listen to my legal <laughs> advice. <laughs> but you, you should definitely read up on fair use because there are lots of times and lots of reasons you can get away with uh, taking other people's content. Uh, but just make sure you understand. And also understand that you it's not fair use until you go to court and a judge agrees that it's fair use. So you still can get in trouble. You can still get sued. And then this is just a legal defense to to say why you had that right. right. But you still have to go and prove it. Unless they never sue you. I mean, that's the other thing. If no one ever gets upset about your usage, then it's effectively legal. <laughs> Again, that doesn't sound like something. That doesn't sound like strong advice. legal advice. You should if be no listening. no one cares, it's legal. <laughs> I mean, to an extent. <laughs> if it never goes before a judge, then yep, I'm with it's you. hard to say whether it's legal or not. <laughs> well, that's all the questions we've got this week. We did it yet again. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope you enjoy your vacation next week. Thank you. Thank you. And you've got maybe a, a, a surprise guest for people on my absence. Is that what I hear? Yeah, so on, let's see, when is our next episode July 11th? Yeah. Uh, you will not be around, but we will have an exciting special guest host who, even if we combine you and me, Nick, this guy has way more podcasting experience than both of us. So uh, I've got be fun. 69 episodes under my belt, so I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He has like 250 episodes of his podcast. Well, that will be very exciting. Done and archived. Yeah. Thanks for letting me take a week off for a vacation. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the, the vacation, the benefits here at Hey Indie Filmmakers are great. Fantastic. One vacation day a year. <laughs> <laughs> and almost no pay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I will see you in a yeah. couple weeks. Yeah. And I'll and see you next week. Sure we'll be Everyone else. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Is it legal? I love all the legal advice we give. No, yeah. We should have a disclaimer at the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs>